In this video, we will be discussing how to make an inference or conduct a hypothesis test when you have two data samples. So this is covered in three different methods, two sample z-tests, two sample t-tests, and paired t-tests. Uh, the procedure for this is the same as conducting a one-sample hypothesis test. First, you state your hypotheses. Second, you calculate your test statistic. Third, you identify the rejection regions using your critical value. Um, and fourth, you make your conclusions. So we'll start with the two-sample z-test. Used when you have two samples, x and y, let's say, each from a normal distribution and independent of each other. X is population of population mean of mu sub 1 and a variance of sigma squared sub 1. And Y will have population variance, population mean of mu sub 2 and a population variance of sigma squared sub 2. Um, so this is a special type of hypothesis test to see if there are any differences between two data sets or two populations. The null hypothesis is written as such. Mu1 minus mu2 is equal to delta naught, where delta naught is some proposed real number, the difference. Um, as with a regular one sample hypothesis test, there are three possible types of alternate hypotheses uh, lower tailed, upper tailed, and two tailed. The test statistic is calculated using this formula. Um, As with a regular one-sample hypothesis test, there are three possible types of alternate hypotheses, lower-tailed, upper-tailed, and two-tailed. Um, you can see the different alternate hypotheses here and their respective rejection regions, um, which is, are calculated, or the bounds of which are denoted by the critical values z sub alpha or z sub alpha over two. The test statistic is calculated using this formula, which takes into account the different population parameters for each data set. Uh, the different sample means, the different variances, and the different sample sizes, if the sample sizes are different. Um, they could be the same, they could be different. It, in this case, they're separate, so it doesn't really make a difference in terms of calculating the test statistic. Um, as with a regular or one sample hypothesis test, this is compared to the rejection region to see if you reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. As before, the boundaries of the rejection region are retrieved from the z-tables um, because you know the population parameters and you know that both populations are normally distributed. However, let's talk about what happens when the population parameters are not known. Then a two sample t-test must be conducted. Note that this still requires the data to come from a normal distribution, and it still requires the data sets to be independent of each other. Um, now, the null hypothesis will remain the same. Mu1 minus mu2 equals delta naught, um, where delta naught is, again, that what you think is the difference between the two populations. If you think there's no difference, then delta naught would be equal to zero. Uh, the alternate hypotheses will also stay the same. Um, in this case, uh, the rejection region bounds are calculated from the t, are, excuse me, are bounded by a t critical value, um, as you can see here, uh, where this is alpha and these are the degrees of freedom, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, what changes is the test statistic. Now, instead of using the population parameters, it uses point estimators to calculate um, uh, calculated from the sample. Uh, again, the sample mean uh, means of both data sets and the sample standard devi deviation. Um, from here, the only thing left to do is find the rejection region. This is slightly more complicated than previously. The rejection region is bounded by t values from the table. However, to look up those t values, we need both an alpha value, and that's easy. It's often set by the problem normally equal to 0.05 or 0.01. Um, but we also need degrees of freedom. In a one sample t-test, degrees of freedom would just be one less than the sample size. 
But here we have two data sets, each with different sample sizes. Um, therefore, we have to use this formula to calculate degrees of freedom. Um, and while this looks complicated, it's really just plug and chug. Um, you can see you're using the sample standard deviations that you've, or the, excuse me, the sample variances that you've already calculated for the test statistic um, and the sample sizes. Um, so once you find those numbers, it's really just plug and chug. And you'll note if you get a decimal here, you'll round down to the nearest integer. And after that, you should be able to find your rejection region or regions, depending on your alternate hypothesis, and proceed as normal. The last two sample inference we'll look at in this video is the paired t-test. This type of test is again performed when you have two data sets um, from normal distributions with unknown parameters. However, in this case, the data sets cannot be assumed to be independent of one another. Um, now, the null hypothesis is stated like so mu sub d is equal to delta naught, um, where delta naught is again that proposed difference. Um, mu sub d in this case is the mean of the differences between the data sets, mu sub 1 minus mu sub 2, or the average of each data point minus the corresponding data point. Um, note that the data sets in the paired t-test must be the same size. Um, so the possible alternate hypotheses are stated here. As usual, lower-tailed, upper-tailed, or two-tailed are all possible. Um, and you'll note that in this case, we can use the regular degrees of freedom because they are the same size. So your t-score is calculated, or excuse me, retrieved from the t-tables using both your alpha value and your degrees of freedom, in this case, just equal to n minus 1. The test statistic is calculated using this formula, where d bar is the sample average of the differences, and delta naught is again the same as from the hypotheses. Uh, S sub d is the sample standard deviation of the differences, um, not the data points themselves, but the differences between the data points. Um, and n is again the sample size. From here, it is conducted the same as the other hypothesis tests. Use the t-tables to find the rejection region bounds plot the calculated test statistic, and make your conclusions. So now the question is when do you know how to know whether to use a two-sample t-test or a paired t-test? Um, this is completely dependent on whether or not the two data sets are independent of each other or not. Uh, two-sample t-tests must have independent data sets. For example, think of a drug trial. Researchers want to see if there is a difference between patients taking a new drug and patients taking a placebo. Provided that there's no overlap between these patient groups, these data sets are independent, and you would conduct that two-sample t-test. On the other hand, comparing pre-test and post-test scores of students would require a paired t-test. This is because um, you would be comparing one student's pre-test score to that same student's post-test score, and clearly these should not be independent of each other. Um, there should be some relationship depending on how well the teaching is done. Um, and again, it also would make no sense to compare one student's pretest score to another different student's post-test score. Um, so that those are good metaphors to think of when you're looking at a problem statement, trying to figure out whether or not um, to use a two-sample or a paired t-test. More information on inferences based on two samples can be found in your textbook. Probability and Statistics for Engineering and the Sciences, the 8th edition by J. DeVore.